these three days for you to partake in professional development. So you are here for a reason. And the reason is clear, that you are interested in reaching your dreams. Today, I'm going to be talking about creating spheres of culturality through performative activity. And I'd like to thank Pearson, especially Martine and Maria Isabel, for being so kind to me when I arrived here yesterday, and also to Pearson, Argentina, Liliana Cincotta, who was the first one to invite me to speak at my first conference in Bolivia. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And the third thank you goes to you. All of you for being here, for being participants, and for wanting to work so enthusiastically on the topics that we all are bringing here today. So, what are we going to do? We're going to look at these questions. What is identity? What is culture? What's the relationship between identity and culture? Can you have a culture if you don't have an identity? Can you have an identity if you don't have a culture? How do they dovetail? How do they go together? What is interculturality? It's different from culturality. What is performative activity? And why is it important in the ELT classroom? You've been sitting for a long time. And I have written a poem, which I think a few of you already know, which is about teachers keeping their students sitting for a long time. It goes like this. The longer you sit on your bum, the more brain dead you become. You know your bum is this. It's the British for the American ass. <laughs> the longer you sit on your bum, the more brain dead you become. Your brain goes dumb, and your bum goes numb. And when that happens, you stop thinking. You don't even get to Bloom's taxonomy lots. You don't get near the hots. So, I need you to get near the hots this afternoon. So, will you stand up, please? Shake your hands. Shake, shake, shake. Come on, you can do better than that. You know you always say that to your students. Shake them up in the air. Shake them low. Shake them high. Shake them low. And shake them hard. Harder, 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 and stop. What do your hands feel like? Do they feel different? Think about your hands. Think of all the things they do for you. Be nicer to your hands. And think about them a lot. Think about how they feel. Do they feel a little bit energetic when you shake them? Do they feel tingly? This is what happens in the brain. So I'd like you to just reach up to the ceiling and push, push, push. And then I'd like you to bring your hands right down to the floor. Down, down, down. I can't go down very far these days. I'm too old. <laughs> okay, good. Take your shoulders back, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And forwards, 26, 105, 500, 29, no, 3,000. One million. What a lot of exercises we've done. Okay, good. You feel a bit better now. Okay, do you need some more exercises? Okay, one more. One more. Right hand out, left hand out, right hand on your left shoulder, left hand on your right shoulder, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap. And swap. 
Okay, listen to the sound of my voice so you can hear in my intonation when it's time to stop. Right hand out, left hand out, right hand on your left hip, left hand on your right hip, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap, and swap. Right hand out, left hand out, right hand on your left earlobe, left hand on your aha uh -huh, nose, aha, uh -huh, I got you into a habit really quickly, and swap, and swap, and swap, and go the other way, and swap, and swap, and swap, and go the other way. Okay, thank you. Sit down. Your brains should be working really well now. So I'll be expecting a lot of intelligent work from you for the rest of my hour. Okay. Just to tell you why I'm interested in interculturality, I was born in Liverpool in medieval times. Long time ago. <laughs> and in Liverpool, we had many nationalities, many ethnicities, many religions. And I was used to growing up with Chinese, Pakistanis, Indians, Polish, Germans, Jamaicans. They were all at school with me. So I didn't think they were strange at all. I didn't consider them any different from me, in fact. And then, when I went to work in, school, in my first school in Coventry, I had 11 different nationalities in my class. And it was very, very hard. They all had special difficulties in learning. So I had another culture. I had the culture of special difficulties, as well as all the cultures of the different nationalities and their religions and their languages. At 25, I left Coventry, where I was living at the time, and I went to live in Singapore. So I left my Anglo-Saxon heritage, whatever that is. My mother was Irish, my father was Welsh, I was born in Liverpool, so I'm a total Heinz 57 mixture. But I went to live in Singapore, where there were Indians, Chinese, and Malays. And I had to learn to adapt. And I always call it walking the tightrope. I had to keep myself in the middle. I had to keep my center. But I had to balance on this tightrope of three different nationalities. And I had to make sure that I didn't fall off either side. So it was very, very difficult. And if you can't adapt, to the place you go to live in, you have to leave because you have to compromise. But how far do you compromise and still keep your own center? That was the question. But me and my husband, both of us, we survived. We then went to live in Saudi Arabia, completely different culture, all Muslims, different kinds of Muslims, Egyptians, Arabs, and I had to wear the black garb. I had to wear the black cloak, cover my whole body. And that was very strange for me. I wasn't allowed to drive. I wasn't allowed to go to the library. I wasn't allowed to go shopping without my husband with me. I wasn't allowed to do anything but stay at home and look after my family. But I was a teacher, so I was allowed to go to school. But I wasn't allowed to leave school until my husband came in the car and the porter would shout, Miss Susan! Miss Susan! And then I was allowed to go out of the school walls into my husband's car. So that was another culture to learn about. Then we went to live in Spain. And that was where I met the Argentines who convinced us to come to South America. So in Spain, we had another culture to learn, completely different, a little bit closer to English culture, but not the same. Then we came to Argentina, 
and we had to learn South American culture. The language may be the same, but the culture is completely different. And so we came for two years in 1989, and we are still living in Argentina. This is my second time in Bolivia. I've been here as a tourist, but we are staying in Argentina forever because our children married Argentines, and we now have four Argentine grandchildren. So we're staying forever. So you will see me in Argentina if ever you come over, and I hope maybe I'll have the chance to come back to Bolivia one day. It's a beautiful country. <laughs> yes? Great, thank you. I have been to Santa Cruz before. I've been to um, Copacabana. I've been to La Paz. And I've been to Soreto, was it, Martin? Sorano. And it was all beautiful. That was in 1991, though, a long time ago. So this is my background and why I'm interested. I'd like to think about stereotypes for a moment, and I'd give, like to give you a little bit of talk time, because you haven't had much time to talk to each other today. I'd like you to turn to somebody near you, somebody behind you, if you wish, and I'd like you to think about these different nationalities, these different groups of people, and see how outsiders see them. So you can choose any one, or you can choose another one, if you would like to choose a different nationality, or a different language group, if you wish, or a different culture like special needs culture, or refugee culture. All of these are different cultures. So I'm going to give you two minutes talk time, and I just want you to talk about how outsiders see South Americans, or how outsiders see Arabs. You may choose South Americans if that's what you are, if that's what you feel most comfortable with. Choose one. Two minutes talk time. And when we get to the end of two minutes, I will go like this. What do you do? You, you do the same. You monkey me. You monkey me. You just do exactly the same. And it goes like wildfire through the whole audience. Okay, two minutes talk time, please. Is there anybody who doesn't understand what they've got to do? Put your hands up now or forever hold your peace. Okay, off you go. Talk time. Yes. Yeah. I'm not talking. Thank you. OK, good. It would be nice to give you much longer. It would be nice to hear what you've got to say, and it would be lovely to mix groups. But we'll be doing that tomorrow in the workshop. So if you want to know more about this and you want the practical aspects of it, because the workshop is totally practical. No PowerPoint, really. So we've looked at, power, at stereotypes. 
And now I'd like you to think about your own identity, not as a stereotype, but how you really are. I know you can't see the wording on this. I don't need you to read it. I need you to see how very complex it can be once you start looking at, who am I? Who are you? What are you? And so I'd like to show you, before you think about it, what those spider lines were labeled as. This lady was a Scottish lady, or maybe is a Scottish lady, and she talked about food preferences on one spider arm, appearance, profession, emotions, how she really operated as an emotional being, her birth date and birthplace, personality traits, nationality, gender, relationships, and her dreams. She spoke about her dreams on one spider arm. Where am I going? What do I want to get to? So, would you like to please just draw your own spidergram? And put on the arms, whatever you want to put on. I want you to think this afternoon. I don't want you to just sit and listen. So would you please take out a piece of paper and a pen, and would you draw your own spidergram, which is entitled, My Identity. I'm going to give you two minutes, no longer, so get going. This is think time, so strictly speaking, it should be you thinking in silence. Is it possible, I wonder? I don't know. If you don't do the thinking, you don't do the thinking. <laughs> and therefore, you don't learn as much. Who are you? And what are your dreams? Writing is different from talking. This is supposed to be in silence. And you're supposed to be drawing something. I'm from Liverpool, remember. Oh, sure. You don't have to follow those, though. It's just to give you a clue. Rosemary's ready. It's not quite the same as your CV. Much more personal. Okay, you can have your students try this. This will be a very good exercise because it actually takes them into the HOTS, the higher order thinking skills. And it may help them to understand who they are because the whole point of interculturality is that they learn who they are before they can start understanding another culture. Our cultures are there insiders, not just outsiders. And so we need our students to understand what their culture is and how it shapes them as people. Oh, what happened? Oh, oh speaker's nightmare. Okay, so just talk to your neighbor now and tell them who you are. 
Refer to your spidergram. Are you on task, ladies? Or are you waving at the screen to see where you are? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you at the back. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, those of you who played the monkey game. Many years ago, in those medieval times, when I was at university, I was introduced to a sociologist being a sociology of education specialist, to a man called Irving Goffman. He wrote a book called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And tomorrow we're going to be doing a performative activity on this in the workshop. He wrote it in 1959. And he said, we have our front stage and we have our backstage. And both of those things make up a model of life as dramaturgy. He said that we never go out onto the front stage of life without preparing our backstage first. Think about it. You prepare what you're going to say before you go to an interview. You rehearse the words you're going to say. Before you go out of the house, well, in the morning, you don't just get out of bed and go straight out. You have a shower, you clean your teeth, you put your costume on, and you go out into the stage of life as a different person from when you actually woke up. Maybe you're still the same person inside. Your identity is still intact, but you use certain items from stagecraft to create your identity and your image. And how often does your image belie your true identity? Those people are called con men or confidence tricksters. Shakespeare said it as well. He said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their in entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. I believe we play more than seven acts in our life. We play thousands of them. And this is what we need to teach our students in the ELT classroom. This also relates, and this is very brief, to 21st century skills, which I believe Joseph talked about this morning. The only one I really need you to look at is the one in the top orange, uh, this uh, doesn't work, but in the top orange arch where it says learning and innovation skills, the four C's. If we work on interculturality with our students, we are working on those four C's. I know you can't see them, so I've put them here. Critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, and communication. And all of those put together create cultural awareness. And this is vitally important for our students to have inside them an awareness of other cultures and how they operate 
so that they can go out into the big, beautiful world and negotiate with other people. As you heard from Martin, I work a lot in China. That is a completely different culture. But I go back again and again and again because I have learned to understand them and they can understand my understanding of them. I learned about the Chinese in Singapore when I lived in Singapore. And now I can work with them at university level. So what is culture? Would you like to pair up or get into groups of three and make a definition for me? What is culture? Just have a little think about it and a little talk. What is culture? What do we mean? I wonder what you talked about. Have a look at these. Thank you. <laughs> this is a dictionary definition. The total set of beliefs, attitudes, customs, behavior, social habits, etc., of the members of a particular society. This is one definition but I think it covers almost everything. What we usually do, however, in our English language classrooms is cover the tip of the iceberg. We tend to look at those superficial things which don't delve deep, deep down into people's culture. And those deep down things, the things that are at the bottom of the iceberg, are the things that are really essential to look at. And you can see that the bottom part of the iceberg is much bigger than the top half, top half, top part of the iceberg, which actually shows. So I need you to think more deeply about how you talk about culture, even with the little ones. My daughter is a kindergarten coordinator, and she deals with interculturality even with three, four, and five-year-olds. She does it mainly through stories, of course. And now, what is performativity? I'm asking you a lot of questions today. Are you thinking hard? Mm, okay, I think I need you all to cross your hearts. Cross your hearts and hope to die. This is an old medieval saying that comes from England, and it means you make a promise, and if you break your promise, somebody, somewhere, <coughs> and you're dead. So, cross your heart, every single person in the room. I'm having to look at some people who are disobedient this afternoon. Cross your heart and hope to die. And repeat after me, dear Susan, I promise, I promise I will think very hard, think very hard. For, the for the rest of this session. And when I get home, I will look back at... No, no, no. It's okay. That's going a little bit too far. Okay, just think very quickly. What is performativity? What do we mean by it? Sorry? It's related to performance, exactly.
It's what I'm going to do when I, I'm going to perform when I get back home. Okay, yeah, that's, a, that's one idea. I think we all perform all the time, actually. Did I perform at the beginning when I came on stage? What did I do? I sang a song. Did I do anything else with my body besides singing? Yes, I did some gestures. I did some miming. I showed you something with my face. Did you like it? I know my voice isn't as good as my husband's voice. He's a rock and roller. But I know people love to hear a song, especially when the message is related to what we're doing, even better, because you are looking for your dreams and you're looking for your code as a teacher. And you enjoyed listening to the song. Were you expecting me to start with a song? Haha, -ha, no, you weren't expecting it, were you? That's another thing, it shocks you into paying attention. So performativity is about using your whole body. You can sing, you can dance, you can recite a poem, you can tell a story, you can do strange sounds if you want, you can do animal sounds. That would still be performativity. It's doing something with your body whilst you are speaking or maybe not even speaking. Miming is also performativity. And I've been investigating this for some time now because it intrigued me. And I discovered that Austin referred to it way back in 1955 when he said, to say something is to do something and to set up the philosophy behind our notion of speech acts, which we refer to today. So to say something is to do something. It's not just to say the words. It's not just to get the grammar right. It's not just to be accurate. It's not just to fill in the blanks. It's a lot of complex things. It is English in action. So that we as human beings use the whole of our bodies and the whole of our minds and the whole of our souls, wherever your soul resides. I don't know, it might be in your little finger. It might be in your big toe, who knows? It's to use the heart. It's to use the emotions. And this is what English language teaching, especially in terms of intercultural, interculturality, must be about. It's about the speaking body in the empty space your body speaks. If I stand like this, what does it speak to you? I'm angry. If I stand like this, happiness, victory, I've won something. If I stand like this, I'm thinking, I'm questioning. My body speaks. I don't even have to have the words. But if we teach our students in our classrooms to use performative activity, we can teach interculturality much more easily and much more happily. Do you believe me? Yes. Be careful. <laughs> My mother was Irish. My father was Welsh. I'm a scorpion. I was born in Liverpool. You know what happened to lots and lots of Scousers way back in the 1800s? They sent all the liars, all the thieves, all the prostitutes, all the robbers to Van Diemen's Island in Australia. So never trust a Liverpudlian. You never know what they might do. Lynn Fells, who has investigated performative activity very, very deeply, says, performative inquiry invites a stance of inquiry, an embodied exploration. And it's the embodied exploration, which is the important phrase here, of curricular concerns, issues, 
assigned texts, communal narratives, and lived experience. Exploration, embodied exploration, lived experiences. In other words, we make the language a live force within the classroom. Ooh, what is it that I do? Okay, we can use images, we can use diagrams, we can discuss other cultures with our students as well as discussing their own cultural aspects. We can have them look at their identity from their own cultural perspectives and also the image that they present to the world. Who are you inside? Who are you on the outside? And if you change your image, what happens? You know if mums go and have their hair done differently, babies very often withdraw from them because the silhouette is not the right silhouette. So this is a model for using within the classroom to create spheres of interculturality. We're dealing with target culture and the learner's own cultural view. We must continually ask questions. Performativity refers to the doing of language. It opposes more abstract conceptions of language as a structure of meaning or symbol system and puts the emphasis on the role of language in the concrete particular transactions of speakers and hearers at specific sites. Performativity focuses on language as action. Don't know what's happening up there, but something's happening. According to Fels and Mayer, performative inquiry assumes that knowledge is embedded in creative processes and rooted in the world of sensorial experience, taking cognizance of the fact that neither knowledge nor experience is a direct representation of the world. These are the cultures that we dealt with when we were dealing with special needs students. This was what we called English in action. To play is to encourage laughter, to explore the underbelly of the unsaid, to inspire new understandings, to engage in wide awakeness. So to sum up, what we need to look at is the source culture materials, the target culture materials, and the international target culture materials that we use. And in the workshop tomorrow, I will be doing strategies and practical work with you for the whole hour. Basically, there are three ways we can look at it. We can look at the target culture textbook, the source culture student, and the target source culture teacher. So if you're a foreign language teacher and you're a foreigner, you can bring the target culture into the classroom. If you're not a foreigner, you can still pass your knowledge of the target culture onto the students. Or you can use an international culture textbook with a source culture student and an international target or source culture teacher. Or, oof, that's a bit bright. You can have a source culture textbook you can have source culture students or you can have a target source culture teacher. And these are the spheres of interculturality that Sandra McKay talks about in her book on international English. And I'd like to just finish with a song about refugee culture. The song is one that you already know but you may never have thought of it as being something to do with refugees. The words go like this. My baby lies over the ocean. My baby lies over the sea. My baby lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my baby to me. 
So it's a very sad song. It's about a man or a woman worrying about their baby who has become a refugee. Or maybe the parents have become a refugee and have left the baby in the home place. So I'd like you to stand up. And I'd like you to tell me what these words are. I'm going to mime some words. I'm going to do some performative activity. Tell me what these words are. My baby lies over the ocean. C. Okay, you've got it. Great. I want you to do the actions and I want you to sing the song with me. Please do the two like this and not like this. Because this in English is the American this. And I wouldn't like to have 400 people in Santa Cruz in Bolivia doing this at me. So please make sure it's Palm out, okay? Palm out. Okay, ready? Sing along with me. You all know the tune. My baby lies over the ocean. My baby lies over the sea. My baby lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my baby to me, to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my baby to me, to me. Okay, now we're going to up the hots, okay? This side of the room, up to the middle, you are the m words. This side of the room, you are the b words. So every time you say a word that begins, begins with, the initial letter is m, you change your position. So in other words, if you're standing, you sit. And when you say another m word, you stand. So yes, clear your seats, please. Don't want any accidents. On this, stand up, stay standing. On this side, are you okay? Oh, okay. Everybody else, stand up, please. On this side of the room, every time you say a word beginning with B, you change your position. So you sit if you're standing and you sit. In. And then when you say a B word again, you stand. Okay, ready? We're going to start now. My baby lies over the ocean. My baby lies over the sea. My baby lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my baby to me, to me. Bring back. Bring back, oh, bring back my baby to me, to me. Bring back, bring back, oh, bring back my baby to me, to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. C. 
See you at the workshop tomorrow for all practical activities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Your attention, please. We're going to continue our presentations today. You can't leave the auditorium. We're going to continue with the presentations. We have one more. Before going to the workshops, we have one more presentation, and then we're going to go to workshops, OK? So please just stay here. Okay, continuing with our presentations now, we're going to present the Vice Director of Graduate Courses and Continuing Education of Aquinas University, Mr. Christian Torres, who is going to give you an introduction to Cambridge English. Let's give her, him a clap, please. Well, hello. Good afternoon. Well, to start with, um, I think we, most of us, and I hope all of us, are into teaching because we find that teaching is a way to transcend, right? I think that there are two things that are very, very important in our world, in our society. One of them is health. Doctors are indispensable. And the other one, I think, is really what teachers do. Um, it's been said everywhere throughout the last years that teachers can make a difference. Teachers are the ones who can change terrorism, who can change violence, who can bring peace through our teaching. So, as a conclusion, the more people that access learning resources and learning experiences, the better it is for all of us. So, what am I saying this? Because the more people we reach, it's the better for our world. So please, if you can broadcast my speech, I'm thankful. We should do that. Knowledge is not something that stops existing because we share it. So we should all try to share all we know to all the people possible. All right? So today I'm here to talk to you about Cambridge. For all the ones who are staying, we will have some prizes and some gifts for you from Cambridge, so you will be lucky to get them. So I'm Christian Torres, as the presenter said. I'm uh, Centric Exams Manager for uh, Centric here in Bolivia at Udabol. And I'm here to introduce uh, Cambridge English to you guys, because Cambridge may be new for you, but it's um, quite big worldwide. All right? So I'm going to start with a contest. Um, and I'm going to ask my friend Marco there to please, Marco, can we bring a pen drive, a Cambridge pen drive, and a bag with gifts, perhaps with a guide, a course for TKT and other stuff? Because I want to ask a question to all these people. And this is this. Complete this phrase, and if you are brave enough to come here, you will get this bag that has a pen drive that Cambridge sent for us. Can I have it? Yeah, thank you. And other gifts, like a paper block and a course for TKT and other things. I want to know one of every mm -mm people speak English. One of every hundred, maybe? What do you think? Anybody wants to come and give the answer? Can I have the microphone? Raise your hand and come. Yeah, anybody. Go. One of? 
One of everybody can speak English. One of everybody. No, I don't think so. Maybe it's a number. One of, one of every ten. One of every ten, they say there. Lower. Five no. there. There? Or you're just guessing now? One of every three. Every? Three. Three? Higher. Higher. Here. One of every four. One of every? Ah. Every five. Lower. It's easy now. Who wants it? Here? Four. One of every five. Four people speak English. One of every four of us speak English. That's about 1.8 billion people around the world speak English with 375 million of them being native speakers. So English is big. Who was it? You got all this. Please come here. A big applause for her. There is nothing worse than a shy teacher, so you should all just relax. This is a pen drive from Cambridge for you and a bag with things. Among them, you have uh, a guide for TKT and a paper block and other stuff. Well, Thanks for being brave and answering. Thank you very much. It was hard to find the answer after one said three and the other one said five, and it was in the middle, right? <laughs> all right. So, do we all agree that English is the gateway for to the world? Yes or no? Yeah. We, we teach English. We have to believe that, right? So, we estimate that the number of English speakers will increase to 2.5 billion by 2050. Hopefully, most of us will still be teaching by then. English will almost always be the common language for international communication and business. So, English is pretty important. We agree on that. Harvard Business Review says that global business speaks English, ready or not, English is now the global language for business. Not Chinese, English. To survive and thrive in a global economy, companies must overcome language barriers, and English will almost always be the common ground. Do we agree on that? Yes? Yes? Great, thank you. Now, how do we help uh, you know, Cambridge English? Say, we believe that well-developed assessment is essential part of effective learning because it focuses learners on what's important to learn. And this is very important indeed. It indicates the standards to be aimed at and provides comprehensive information about learners' strengths and weaknesses. And this is very, very important. Perhaps it is kind of new in Bolivia. You know, the government has, has not established an issue about language teaching and learning yet. We all know is what, what, what we so far know is that this new law, Avelino Signani Elizardo Perez, the law of education, says that foreign languages are compulsory to be taught in the whole educational system. That's primary, high school, and university studies. That's what we know so far. That the new law of education says that international languages are to be taught. Eventually, they will see how it should be measured. And this is happening in many, many countries, in Latin America and other countries. My colleagues that come from other countries will support this. And this means that both students and teachers will need a certification of studies because it will not be good enough to just learn and teach. You need to have a piece of paper that says that you are capable of speaking English and that you have the abilities to teach English as well. So that's why these certifications are so important. Wouldn't it be nice to be validated worldwide? To, be, um, to say, I'm a good English teacher because Cambridge says so, and this is valid in the whole world? It is. So, Cambridge English exams are designed in such a way as to accurately predict a candidate's ability to use English in real life situations. First of all, it comes from authentic sources. What Cambridge does is they search on books and magazines and soap operas and movies and get the real English to its tests. Tasks in the test are based on realistic situations, so they are not something really foreign to anybody. Also, all exams test four language skills. You know the four language skills, listening, reading, writing, and speaking, as well as the knowledge of language structure and its use but they do not have a grammar section by itself. They incorporate grammar in the four skills, which makes exam, you know, as, as it should be. 
and it paired speaking test format for all level based exams, which means that students do not face the examiner just by themselves. They are in pairs, two students, or in three if they are the last ones in the test, and they have a chance to interact. This makes everything easier in the tests. One very important thing is that Cambridge English examinations are not British English examinations. They are Cambridge English. Cambridge English is something neutral. So they incorporate in the exams different varieties of English, uh, American, British, among others. So it is not only if you teach British English that you have to use Cambridge examinations. This is very important. And also, our test content is pre-tested to ensure fairness to all candidates. So before tests are given, they are tested in small groups to make sure that they are all right. And we support candidates who have special requirements. All examination centers have special training to adequately deal with people with special requirements. So it's interesting. So what does this mean? That Cambridge English exams help learners to learn English and develop the communicative skills needed to be successful. This is quite new for Bolivia, but again, Cambridge is very big worldwide. So Cambridge English is part of the University of Cambridge. That's very important. Um, it has more than, than 100 years of experience in assessing English language and helping the world to learn and communicate in English more effectively. And it's delivered over 550 million exams since 1913. So it's a very old and very big institution. Okay. It looks like if I were in Cambridge. Can you take a picture of me here? <laughs> Hi, Mom. I'm in Cambridge. All right. So um, it's a s that it is we have a total commitment to quality and fairness. To start with fulfilling Cambridge University mission worldwide and delivering good exams. Um, we're constantly reviewing and improving our exams and our way and the way we report our results and developing transparent international um, standards. All Cambridge is made in a system that is constantly evolving and looking for perfection so that we can give all teachers and students and candidates a good experience and a valid experience to our times and to English. Cambridge exams are accepted by over 20,000 organizations worldwide. Among them, we have more than 11,000 higher and further education institutions more than 6,000 corporate users, like Microsoft or Google, and more than 500 governments and ministries from 80 countries. Hopefully, Bolivia will be one of them soon. Chile, Peru are already joining this list. Among other numbers, 5 million people in 130 countries take Cambridge English exams and teaching qualifications every year. We are the producer and co-owner of IELTS, 2.5 million tests and, and taken each year, and 8 million followers in social media channels. So this is just to show you how big Cambridge Assessment English is. Well, before, Cambridge English is the old thing now, because in 2019, they changed its name to Cambridge Assessment English. It was Cambridge English before, and before it was Cambridge as all examinations, just in case. So. Extended international network in over 130 countries, among them Bolivia. More than 52,000 registered schools, more than 2,700 uh, authorized centers in 130 countries, and more than 30,000 trained examiners. About this number, wouldn't you like your school to be in this list? That is possible. You can be either a training center if you train your students to get Cambridge exams, or you can be uh, Cambridge School, if all teachers and students work on the structure of Cambridge, and that is possible for all of you. That's important to say. Um, we are an authorized center in Bolivia. Our code is BO009. Um, you have to be an authorized center to uh, administer examinations. And when they say 30,000 uh, trained examiners, it means that Cambridge trains all speaking examiners, all the staff that works for Cambridge in any country has specific training to, use to, t to test Cambridge exams. Those are called speaking examiners that are led by a 
team leader that is led by a regional leader, and so on, so on, so on. So they have all control of, of exams. It doesn't matter where the tests are given. So we follow the criteria set by the CEFRL. Do you know what CEFRL stands for? Yes? Who wants to come and say it? Come and say it. You will get a prize. Let's give another pen drive and some souvenirs from Cambridge, Marco. Whoever is brave enough to come and say what CEFRL means. Come on, come here. There's nothing worse than a shy teacher. You are a brave teacher? Yes? Come up, sirs. I won't bite. Bah! Okay, say it. Here, here. Common European Frame of Reference for Languages. Yes, it's a common European framework of reference for languages. Here you have your pen drive and your souvenirs from Cambridge. Thank you very much. Claps for her. Thank you so much. So yes, it is a common European framework of reference for languages. And it is the guideline used to describe achievements of learners of foreign languages across Europe and increasingly in other countries. Hopefully, soon Bolivia will some to these countries. The Common European Framework for Reference of Languages has six levels. Do you know how these levels are named? Again, can I, can, do I have more of those pen drives, Marco? Yes? Anybody wants to name the six of them? A different person that has not won anything yet? Come here. No, I mean the bag and the pen drive. Yep, thank you. Six levels. What's your name? Uh, Stefano. Stefano. Yep. There's tell me. Tell us. Uh, A1, A2, right. B1, B2, C1, C2. Which one is the lowest? A1. Which one is the highest? Um, C2. Very good. I know. An applause for my friend. <laughs> so there you go. You have your pen right here and a bag of souvenirs from Cambridge. Thank you so much for participating. So, regarding Cambridge assessment English qualifications, it has a main suit of exams that most of us should know, which are, who can tell me the most important, the most important five exams of Cambridge? Another pen drive and a bag of souvenirs from Cambridge, if you know the five most important exams from Cambridge. You cannot participate, because I know you know them. Anybody? All right, come. Tell us. What's your name? Eugenia de Loza. Eugenia, please tell us. It's CAT, Cat? which stands for Key English Test. Just, just, just OK. Cat. Don't spoil what's Cat. coming next. FCE, right. CAE, and proficiency. CPE. All right, CPE. Very good. A big applause for her. CAT, PET, FCE, CAE, and CPE. That's it. Thank you so much. So, the first one, the key ET test stands for key English test, right? Am I right? Yes? And then we have the preliminary English test. And then we have the first certificate in English, the advanced uh, the certificate in advanced English and the certificate in proficiency in English, just to make this not as long as, as, as to get you tired, guys. So these are the exams of Cambridge. There is something very good about Cambridge, that this has a set of exams for young learners, for kids, and these beautiful exams with great pictures, easy to understand, and easy to you know, just overcome for students uh, from ages 6 to, I think, 11 or 12, I'm not sure. So it, they are called the Young Learner Examinations. So if you teach primary school and you feel that there is no international test for your kids, you're wrong. Here you have the Young, the, the young Learners Examinations that are starters, movers, and flyers. And then you have the exams for schools. The main suit and the exams for schools are very similar with the difference that these exams have friendlier topics for teenagers. And these ones have friendlier topics for adults. So if you work at school, in secondary, for example, high school, you may want to use these ones. That still have three different levels, CAT, PET, 
and first certificate. First certificate gets you up to a B2 level, PET for a B1 level, and KET up to an A2 level. So you don't have to be proficient in English to actually use a Cambridge exam. And then you have the means to that our friend just said, CAT, preliminary, first and advanced, and proficiency. That is the top of the top of the top of the exams. And then you also have some business qualifications, legal qualifications, financial qualifications, the business qualifications, and the IELTS, which is used to migrate to many countries and so on. So in Bolivia so far, we're offering up to this place all tests for kids, for schools, and the main suit, plus something for you. We'll talk about it later. But these are the exams. Now, it is always vulnerable for all of us to say, what if I fail? What if my students fail? The good thing is that Cambridge has thought about that, and you don't have always to be in the level, because you have a pass, a merit, or distinction. Great. So even if you are not in the right level, you could still get a certificate if you are close to it, which is good because that way we don't have students frustrated, right? And uh, our exams are so good that we are the winner of the Queen's Award in 2015, which shows that it's actually good work we, we've been doing with Cambridge. Now, how about teachers? You are teachers, and teachers need qualifications as well, don't we? Yes? Yeah, so for teachers we have the TKT, the Teaching Knowledge Test, which are easy, very easy teacher, very easy test that allow us to get certified as well. What does TKT stand for? Anybody? Come, come and get another gift. I will already have somebody who was fast. Tell us, buddy. Hello. There? Hi, yes, uh, it's teaching knowledge test. Teaching, right. What's your name? Guillermo. Guillermo, thank you very much. It's teaching knowledge test. This is your bag of souvenirs, and this is your pen drive. Okay. Thank you very much. Applause for Guillermo. <laughs> yes, CKT stands for teaching knowledge test, and these tests are used to actually measure or say if you do have the basic knowledge of teaching. Um, the teaching knowledge test, TKT, says it's a test. Of course, it's a test developed by Cambridge Assessment English for teachers of English to speakers of other languages. It's used to test candidates' knowledge of concepts related to language. It's used the background to practice and language teaching and learning. So there is no better way to tell the world that you are a good English teacher and that you have the capacity to teach adequately than having an international certification from the University of Cambridge that says so. Right? So this examination has 2,000 examination centers in 130 countries around the world. In Bolivia, this university is the place where you can get yourself certified. Tests are available throughout the year in approved exam centers like Udabol, that is Center 009. And in Bolivia, we have centers in Santa Cruz, Cochabamba, Oruro, and, Santa, and, or, and La Paz. I mean, but we can always organize venues in Oruro, Potosi, Tarija, Sucre, if you feel that you need one. If you get together with your friends, with your colleagues, and you want to have, and you want to take the test, you just have to contact us and we can go to your city and take the test for you so that we can all get certified. There are three levels of TKT. The first one, it's called language background to language learning and teaching. It's very easy, trust me. The second one is lesson planning and use of resource for language teaching. And the third one is managing the teaching and learning process. These three things we all do every day. I'm sure that you know how to do a lesson plan. I'm, use, I'm sure that you know how to use resources for language teaching, managing the process, and uh, that you have a background in language and, and, and teaching and learning. So sometimes we, th we, we feel that, we, well, at least I've heard that some of us think that you have to have courses before taking a TKT, and it is not necessary, really, because if you see the contents of the test, they are pretty, very, very, very simple. So try it. And you also have the CLIL, that is Content and Language Integrated Learning, plus the Young Learners Exam, if you want to get more certificates. But these three ones, the basic ones, are very easy to pass. You should all have them. 
Ticket is suitable for teachers of English in primary, secondary, or adult teaching context for all of us. You see, TKT may be taken by even a pre-service teacher. It means that teachers have, that have not studied teaching could already take these exams and pass them. That's how easy they are. And teachers who wish to refresh and extend their, language, their teaching knowledge, and teachers who are moving to teaching English after teaching another subject. So they are good enough for graduate or young learners. And the recognition is good because it's worldwide, first of all. Um, and you're showing your employers, uh, the head teacher, the director, or the dean, in the case of universities, that you are developing as a teacher, that you are familiar with different teaching methodologies, that you know how to use teaching resources effectively, that you understand the key aspect of lesson planning, and that you can use different classroom management methods and different, to different needs. So it's a very good way to show how good you are. And it is an international recognition that we should all take advantage of. Let's just pass this. Okay, so candidates are not required to fulfill any specific criteria to take TKT. You don't need to have a degree. You don't need to prove your experience in teaching. You only need your ID. You go and re you, re you register, and it is as easy as that. But you are expected to be familiar with language relating to the practice of English language teaching. This is not an English test. This is a teaching test. It, teaches, it, it evaluates how good you handle teaching principles. It's just a pen and paper test. Uh, it's a, it is no pass or fail. I will show you in a minute. This is the certificate you get. Teaching knowledge test is given by Cambridge itself. It's sent after you get your test taken. The test is sent to the United, the United Kingdom. Then they correct it and then they send the marks and the certificate. Um, in Bolivia, the next TKT will be offered in the week throughout March 18 to March 13, 23rd. Sorry. So if you are interested, this is the week where you will be able to be tested. If you took a TKT one already, you could take a TKT two. two or a TKT3. These are the dates. Now, where you can take them or how you can register, you can visit our offices of Udabol in La Paz, Santa Cruz, Cochabamba, Oruro. You could visit our, start, our stands here. There is a stand there with Marco here, but the stand is there. And there is another stand downstairs if you are interested or you want more information. And you can always write to Cambridge at udabol.edu.bol if you have any questions. The point is that you learn how good this is for you. Now, we've been talking to Isela, Isela Coronado, who is, I don't think she's here. Well, I, we have to give her a good applause, even if she's not here, because she is the one who's been working very hard to get this together. And it, trust me, it is not easy to set, up, so to set up a meeting, a congress, a conference. It is very, very hard. It demands a lot of logistics, and I think she's done a terrific job on this. Okay, so, um, the cost of these exams is $110, but because of beta, it will only be $80 throughout the conference. That means that if you register today, tomorrow, or Wednesday, you will only pay $80. Plus, you will get access to our online preparation course. If you are not sure if you know or you don't know and you have doubts or questions, you will have access, free access to all contents to get ready for the exam in case you're not ready. But there is something big that Cambridge and Udabol have allowed me to do. It's very big. If you register throughout these three days, one, well, for every five candidates enrolled for TKT or main suit exams, CAE or CPE, we will give one TKT exam for free. For every five of you that register to an exam, we will, you will come here throughout this event, and we will give one TKT free. For example, if, if you register for TKT 1, one of the five people who registered will get a TKT 2 for free. That is like $100, you know, it's worth it. We will have raffles today, tomorrow, and Wednesday for all you guys who are willing to invest in your training and certification. So that's what we've got for you throughout this conference. We want you to get certified because I don't think there is something, anything better than schools that have teachers with valid certifications and students who have as well achieved international certifications. That's the best way to show us, to show the school, to show the parents, and to show Bolivia and the world that we are doing a good job, right? So 
Another good thing is that with Udable, we'll be launching throughout this year a Diplomado en Enseñanza de Idiomas, and we'll keep you posted on that together with Beta. So that's it. That's the news I had for you. This is about Cambridge. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a lot of candidates for the upcoming TKT test. Have a very nice afternoon.